Uh, if you listen to this podcast, you know the title of it is The Innovator's Mindset. And a lot of people, when they hear innovation, they think about the, the latest and greatest, the, the newest things that we can do. And in The Innovator's Mindset, the book, I actually define innovation as doing something new and better. And the key word there is better. In fact, it's crucial. It's a word that you can't take out of that because I've actually seen a lot of new things in education that are not better, that actually have created more issues than anything. And so a lot of times when we actually have connected this idea, we're, we're always encouraging p- teachers to you know be on the cutting edge, do the, the latest and greatest things, but we should always be encouraging educators to do the best stuff. And it doesn't matter where that, that stuff came from, what generation, what, what time period, and I think a lot of the stuff that we're doing, like, for example, uh, an abundance of testing, not necessarily better. I actually would not even say not necessarily not better for our kids actually probably causes more issues. But something I've been guilty of is saying in the past, who are traditional teachers. And I'm not saying traditional to mean traditional. I was saying traditional to mean bad. And the idea that I've really tried to be cognizant of uh, is that traditional does not equal bad and innovation does not necessary or new does not equal good and in this conversation with jan iwasi it from uh she's from hawaii she wrote this book called educating with aloha Aloha. she is a retired educator she's been teaching 45 years and we talked about what that means uh really thinking about empathy innovation and how they connect how relationships are really important and you know if you think about this 50 years ago relationships were by far the most important thing in education but 50 years from now it will be even more so and the more we connect, the better that is. But that's a traditional practice. That's something my teachers did. And I hope I did as an educator. And I hope my kids' teachers do as well. And so we talk about some of those things that we should hold on to. Some of those things that we connect. But the focus for both Jan and myself is about in ensuring that schools continuously get better. That they're growing. And whatever practice you're using, whether it's from the 1950s or it's from today... As long as it helps kids grow, we're on the right path. And so that's something I was really thinking about after recording this podcast with Jan. She's an absolutely wonderful person, uh, accomplished author, a very accomplished educator. I know you're going to love it. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kuros and welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I am so blessed to have Jen Iwasi and I'm trying to say that as best I can. Um, You're You're doing good. Thank you. And so Jen and I um, actually met uh, years ago um, in Hawaii when I was lucky enough to be able to uh, speak there. I don't know if I'm allowed there as a Canadian right now, so who knows, right? This might be the only way we're allowed to talk. So uh, I, I'm uh, I'm excited to connect with you. But not only did we actually meet at that event, uh, we've stayed in touch over Twitter, you know, through email. And uh, Jan actually has a book out called Educating with Aloha, and we'll talk about that more in the podcast. But Jan, thank you so much for for taking the time out of your day. Um, and you actually. You, you are, you know, you are retired, but let's not, I, when you're telling me, it's not like you're not keeping really busy. Like, it's not like you just have all this time to do whatever you want. Right. So I actually had way more time in my schedule uh, to do this podcast. So we had to work like you, you were much more limited. So uh, Jan, can you actually just tell everyone um, just who you are, um, what you do today and kind of how you got to that point? Okay. So uh, my name is Jannie Wasi. I was an educator for 45 years until I retired in 2018. Um, I grew up in Hawaii in a pineapple plantation village. So it was a small community where everybody really cared about each other. And everybody was working um, in the pineapple industry, including my dad. And, um, you know, George, I'm sure you can relate to this, but my dad had to quit school in age 15 because he was the oldest in his family of seven yeah. children and it was an expectation that he go to work to help support the family and he had wanted to be a teacher never got to do that yeah. but um i like to think that i kind of followed in his footsteps and actually i became a teacher um 
I grew up in a family of five. Uh, my parents were, um, you know, I dedicated my second book to my my parents because they were my first teachers and they were the ones who really influenced me and all of my siblings. You know, we all were able to go to college and and become something, make, make something of ourselves, you know, and um, all in different professions. My older sister was an attorney and she became a judge. Um, my younger sister works in the, uh, for a developer and she works a lot with the community. My brother is, um, was a banker and then he became the rose to become the city managing director. And my youngest brother is actually a professor at the University of California at Merced in um, genetics and biology. So we all became, um, and I know it's because of my parents and what they uh, instilled in us. And, um, and it wasn't just them, it was our community, you know, small plantation community where everybody wanted us to be better than what they mm -hmm. were. And so I became a teacher uh, with Head Start first and then with the Department of Education. And then I went into administration. And when I retired in 2018, I wrote my first book, which was called Leading with Aloha from the Pineapple Fields to the Principal's Office. And then in 2019, no, 2020, uh, when the pandemic hit and I was sitting at home feeling very badly because... Mm. I knew how much schools were struggling. I decided to write my second book, which is called Educating with Aloha, Reflections from the Heart on Teaching and Learning. And it's based on blogs that I had written from the time I started blogging in 2012. And George, you were one of the ones who really inspired me to continue to blog. So thank you. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad. Hey, that's that's a good thing for the world, right? Not just for you, mm -hmm. but for the entire world that you get to share your story. And, and you had mentioned that, you know, obviously... I would resonate with what you shared. And I know it's because you know about my parents and my mm -hmm. parents had very limited education. Mm -hmm. And I, I really, I, I think about that a lot. Um, they they saw um, it, at the time, because my mom had a grade six education, my dad had a grade two education. They saw education as a way to something better than what they had, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think part of it, like I, I still see that, but I think that means we have to like evolve in education as well. I think that's a really important aspect. The, the other thing too that you, um, you mentioned, and I think is uh, really important to me. I grew up in a small town called Humboldt, Saskatchewan. And if you're Canadian, uh, you know Humboldt, Saskatchewan, because there was actually a very tragic um, accident there several years ago with a hockey team, many uh, kids, including one who I taught in Alberta, actually had passed away. And um, in the entire country actually watched um, watched the community come together to support these families. And I wasn't shocked at all because I, I just I grew up in that community and I knew um, how important it was. And I really saw school and I appreciate this about what you're saying, that school was really central to community, right? Like it was really important to everyone because, as you said, um, they saw it as a way to, you know, have a better life. And I, I see, I still see that same thing for my, uh, for my own kids is that education should lead to something better than what I had. And, you know, that, that is a way of the world. Uh, and so I, I really appreciate, um, you sharing that. And so like when you, when you started, um, in education and we kind of talked about this a little bit on our last podcast, uh, what are some of the things that you have seen that, kind of have evolved, but maybe not necessarily for the, for, you know, are, are the best. Like, is there something that you're, do you have any concerns about where education, because like, uh, we talked about this a little bit, like I'm all about innovation. And but mm -hmm. when I talk about innovation, I always say about doing new and better, it has to be better, not just new. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes we, our focus is not, is a little bit less on community, right? It is a little bit more on, on actually just having students, uh, you know, go off to be lawyers when they're, you know, pre prepping them at kindergarten, right? Like, I'm like, can you just let them be kids? So is there anything that you, you know, you, when you see in education that um, maybe isn't necessarily the best direction, that maybe have lost some of the things that, you know, our parents saw as the value? Well, um, we talked about testing. I think that testing is is really overrated. I think grade point averages are really overrated. I think that really, um, you know, I was a elementary school 
you know, all throughout my my career. And I think at that age, kids really do enjoy learning. Mm -hmm. If you give them that opportunity, I don't think that they, I think they need to have choices in what they do and how they do it. And I think we as uh, educators need to realize that every child is different. And so one size doesn't fit all. And so what might work for one child doesn't necessarily work for the other. And that's where the relationships really matter. You need to know the child to know mm -hmm. what's going to work for them and what they're interested in and how you're going to, you know, how you're going to treat them because you can't treat them all right. to, the same. Mm -hmm. And um, I am concerned that um, we are putting so much uh, emphasis on, on getting kids ready for testing and um, that, and I will tell you that as a teacher, of course, I wanted my kids to do well, mm -hmm. but I never, um, I never tried to um, what test give them that test prep or you know I mean right. and still it was difficult for some of the kids. I mean I know that I had some kids crying because they because I couldn't help them and I and it broke my heart that I mm -hmm. couldn't help them because that's not allowed. Um, but I really think that when you have an innovative teacher who understands about relationships and how important yep. that is, that children will rise and they will find something that they are passionate about and they will find that they are good at something. And that's what we need to promote, you know, the, the individu individuality of each mm -hmm. child and um, their strengths. And, um, you know, it's, Sometimes I think there's just not enough time in the day to do that. Right. Uh, and, may, and maybe even sometimes there's like, there's such an emphasis on the wrong thing that we have to, do you know what I mean? Like if you look at, for example, the, one of the arguments is parents, parents want their kids to, you know, they're all about the GPA going to college, things like that. Mm -hmm. I actually don't necessarily believe that. I actually, I think parents want what's best for their kids. And sometimes they're, they're not, like for lack of a better term off the top of my head, they're brainwashed to think that everything is about grades. And I know that my parents just want what's best for me. And if I actually, to be honest with you, I've written several books. I've, you know, I've done well in my career. If you based my, my, my life on what my GPA was in school, I would have done terribly, right? Like I wasn't a very strong academic student. I was a very smart kid. But I was like mm -hmm. smart with relationships, uh, you know, teachers actually I had I had developed, you know, teachers knew that um, if I like I was I had a pretty quick wit. So even at a young age, like I could, you know, really, you know, make a teacher's day very hard. Mm -hmm. And some of them understood. They're like, you know, maybe like we got to teach this guy how to use this for good instead of evil. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so like like he, he actually is very quick on his feet, but this he's not necessarily using it in the best way. And mm -hmm. so I think, I think part of it, as you said, uh, and I actually just wrote a blog post on this is that we don't want, we don't need kids to be good at the same thing. We need every mm -hmm. kid to be good at something. Right. Yes. And, and yes. finding that and part of that too. Mm -hmm. And I think like, if you look at, and this is what I was talking about the parents, um, a lot of the best teachers I've ever worked with were terrible students. But if I, if I hired them based solely on their GPA, a lot of teachers I know who had very strong GPAs we're not mm -hmm. necessarily great teachers. And so like it, it, there is a, there is a disconnect there. And I think we have to kind of mm -hmm. understand that there are doors opening for them. Um, yes. The other thing that you said about test prep that I, I think is really interesting is a lot of schools say that, you know, our, our school our you know, our school is over test. And I'm like, do they over test because of government or because your school district makes you take practice tests so they can do really good on the test? And I think sometimes we we actually compound that issue, not necessarily. And I'm not saying that's true in all places, but I really appreciate that because I know you and I have a lot of similar thinking on really helping kids and understanding them as individuals. And that's something that's something really important. And so, like for anyone that's listening, um, you know, go through your career. What are like maybe like some strategies that you either saw as an administrator? Uh, you did as a teacher that really helped, you know, a, a student that was struggling to actually not necessarily do better in that subject that you were teaching, mm -hmm. but just to 
better, you know, do better mm -hmm. in, in whatever field. What are some things that you've, you've seen up throughout your career that really were beneficial in that? Mm -hmm. Well, I mentioned relationships and I think that's probably the most important thing. Um, you know, truthfully, George, you talk about yourself as a student and I would probably mm -hmm. have loved you as a student because I actually <laughs> liked the right. rascal boys. The I mean, I did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I saw them as being creative and I, I think that sometimes we do our, um, our boys a disservice in school, you know, expecting them to mm -hmm. sit still. And, and I shouldn't say just boys, cause I'm sure it's the same with girls, but I think girls somehow they, they are a little more compliant, I guess, in certain ways. But I, I really think that um, when, as a as a teacher, giving kids choices for one thing, mm -hmm. you know, not expecting them all to um, to do the same thing at the same time in the same way, but having choice boards or having you know rotations so that they could do different things and they could work on projects with their. Um, with others who are interested in the same kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and, and all of that evolved over time. Yes, as a preschool teacher, you know, we didn't have the academics. We, we were about uh, the whole child mm -hmm. and play as being very important for young children. Mm -hmm. And I carried that with me throughout my career. I really felt that kids needed to have that time uh, for choice and for um, and for play. They needed to be able to. Uh, and when I say play, I mean you know you have different activities that they can do. So you you even have you know and and we always had like a science corner, and that mm -hmm. was really the most popular. And and I wish that all classes had that because especially boys, they love to explore bugs and, and, you know, things like that, um, magnets and, and um, whatever we had on the table, they would really enjoy exploring with, and sometimes not using it appropriately, but teaching them how to use it. Right. And um, so a lot of hands-on things I think is very important. I think a lot of um, variety of materials at different levels for all kids, because you never know what's going to interest the child. And so even if a child was not a good reader, but it was a book about football right. that had pictures that they could look at, you know, why should we tell them that they shouldn't be able to read that book just because it's not their grade level? So I think for myself as an educator and what I tried to um, emphasize with the teachers that worked at our school was all of you are individuals, just like all of the children in your classroom are individuals. And I'm not going to treat you all the same way because, but what we're going to try to do is, is learn from each other. And so giving them that opportunity to collaborate and to work in small groups and to, to help each other to get better because we wanted our teachers to get better because that's how our kids would, would grow as well. well. And I think the the I think the choice thing is really crucial, but I also think it's not about just like let kids do whatever they want, make any choices, but it's actually really helping them find the right choices. So you'd mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, you probably would have liked me, you know, as a kid, I was a little mm -hmm. bit a troublemaker, like, you know, pretty active. And so like one of one of the examples I give often is um, a lot of schools have like, you know, differentiated seating. So they'll have like couches, they'll have high tables, you know, they'll have like regular, you know, desks, whatever. And if, if I was in a class in school and I'm thinking, especially at the middle school, high school level, mm -hmm. and you put a couch in your class, I would gravitate to that seat immediately. I would do nothing though. I would like, just kind of like, I would be probably, you know, almost like asleep. I'm a big couch guy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so based on how I know I am now, right. And it took me until my thirties to figure out whenever I write something, I actually in my office right now, I actually have like a, a high table so I can stand and write and, and it allows me to fidget, but I'm very productive in that space. So like, like if a teacher sees that space, it's like, Hey, I know that's the choice that you want to make. Is that the choice that's most beneficial to help you grow? Not just what is not, not just about what you want to do, but what actually helps you. And I think that's, that's a really important aspect is like helping is like, I think a lot of people just think choice is a free for all, 
Mm-hmm. As opposed to let's help kids make choices, <clears throat> excuse me, that are beneficial. And so, mm-hmm. hey, Jan, I do want to ask you mm-hmm. about uh, your book. I have it. And thank you for sending me an autographed copy. And if you can see it, it's called uh, Educating with Aloha. So, first of all, what does it mean? And that's going to be the title of the podcast. So what does it mean? First of all, don't even tell us about the book. What does it mean, educating with aloha? What does that mean? Well, aloha is much more than just a word in Hawaii. You know, it's not just about hello and goodbye. It's about, um, and so I talk about leading, leading and educating with love, with compassion, with empathy and respect. That's what I consider aloha. And so, um, you know, I, I was a principal for 15 years at a military impacted school where most of the students, 98% were from military families. Hmm. And they were not going to be in Hawaii for very long. That was not going to be their um, their home like, like Hawaii is for me. So we wanted them to experience what that meant. Mm-hmm. And so everything that we did, you know, that culture had to be... Um, we we really try to uh, have a culture of aloha at our school where we took the kids where they were at, where we really tried to show them that we cared about them because, you know, it's, it's pretty hard when you consider um, coming in the middle of the year, you mm-hmm. know, leaving your right. friends at another school and having to make new friends again. And, some kids really had a difficult time with that. So the things that we put into place at our school, I mean, we wanted to make sure that when they came in to register, that they would be greeted with friendly faces, uh, that the campus was nice and clean and looked like a very um, a, a nice place for their children to come. Um, we wanted to make sure that they felt accepted and welcomed into their new classroom. So we had like um, a transition coordinator who took them on a tour of the school um, before school, before they started. Uh, we had student greeters who would meet them in, in the front of the school on the first day and give them a little lay and escort them to their classroom and point out, you know, buildings or, or people who are passing by so that the child at least had some, um, at least they felt like they were being welcomed into our into our um, into our school, and anybody who was wearing that lay on the first year of school, we knew that they were a new student. So we, if they looked a little confused, we would help them and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, just giving them the experiences of of um, yes, you are a military child. Yes, we know you're new, but we're going to welcome you as part of our our ohana, our family. And, um, you know, we, we think that we did a good job with that. We think that when they left our school, they knew what aloha meant. And, you know, living on an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh, land is finite, you know. One of the things that we really wanted to share with them was um, about caring for this land, caring for this um our, our aina, our land. So, you know, our kids did a lot of project-based learning about trash, what we can do. Because, um, or they planted, they learned about um, invasive plants and they went in and helped by uh, pulling out the invasive plants and replanting native Hawaiian plants. And, um, a lot of project-based learning that made them realize that, hey, you know, we can be a part of the change that we need to see in our world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we wanted them to be able to take those skills and wherever they went to, you know, carry it with them and maybe make change wherever they went. So, yeah. I I think there's so much that I could talk about from what you said. The the one thing that really resonates with me is the focus on empathy. And I Mm -hmm. think uh, when you think about empathy, you're talking about um, a teaching staff that probably you know is in hawaii all the time yes. you know with with a group of kids who are you know moving in and out of uh, uh, of the area and i think mm-hmm. when we talk about empathy it's it's about understanding people that have different viewpoints and experiences and you know um 
just different elements of this too. And I think this, that's, that's like a very important uh, element for the entire world, not just in education. Right. Cause I think a lot of times, mm -hmm. as soon as I don't understand you, then I can just place you into, you know, a, a different aspect, but trying to actually understand why does someone, you know, uh, maybe act the way that they do have the, you know, the viewpoints that they do. And I think empathy is a really important aspect that I think we say a lot in education, um, but sometimes don't necessarily model that. Right. And I think that that's an important element. Um, I want to read the, just a little bit about what you said, um, on the back of your book, uh, you said, uh, so it says at the top hot passion for education. How do we change the way teachers teach and children learn? A veteran of 45 years in public schooling shares, and this is the part I want to emphasize, innovative ideas for building caring communities. So one of the things I really appreciate about your work is that, um, and it's very aligned with the stuff that I talk about, is the idea of innovation and relationships being necessary for one another. Because I've had conversations where people say, like, relationships are not necessary to innovation. I'm like, that's the only way you get people doing things that, they probably couldn't do without that relationship. So when you when you when you say that, like, do you have an example of like an like about that connection between innovation and communities and and how like from the book that you you could share with everybody or maybe just from your experience? Mm -hmm. I think I think we had a very innovative staff, and I think that they knew that they had permission to try new ideas, and I think that that was very important. That was. Um, Okay, so let me just, the first year that I got there, and I got there in the second semester, and we had a reading program that was very scripted. Mm -hmm. And I, I could, I, I, when I got there, that was the first question they asked me, are we going to continue with it? And I said, you know, it's kind of early for me. I, I don't have, to, I need to get to know you folks all first before I, you know, we talk about this. Well, it just so happened that um, we were, our enrollment went down and we were given one less resource teacher. And so our teacher said, you know what, if we're going to do this program, we can run it on our own. We don't need right. oversight from the national company that was running it. Right. And um, to make a long story short, we got rid of it. And uh, at first the teachers were like alarmed. What are we going to do? And I said, didn't you? learn how to teach reading in college? And they said, yes. And I said, you know, this is your opportunity to try new ideas. Mm -hmm. And the excitement that they had. And, and I think that that, that first experience where, because I kept telling them, you know, I'm not going to make decisions for you. There are going to be some decisions I have to make because it comes from on top. There's some decisions that we're going to make after talking it over, but there are some decisions about your classroom that I'm not going to tell you what to make. As long as your kids are happy, they're learning and, you know, you're happy, you know, and so they tried a lot of new ideas and they had, they collaborated and, mm -hmm. and we tried, you know, we were able to purchase some things that they like wanted, like tech sets of books that they wanted to share with their kids. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, that, I think that was what that was what made me successful at the school, I think, because mm -hmm. it started from that very first semester when I supported them. And um, because I'll tell you that most of those, many of those teachers did not like the program. Right. But we had already paid for it. We had, in, they had invested in it and um, it all worked out. I mean, it, it really did work out. And after that, they were much more willing to try new ideas. So we have this huge garden on our campus that was a result of teachers saying, we mm -hmm. want to use the garden to teach our kids real world skills and to, you know, uh, science, social studies, language arts, math can all be included. And, and it was. And that mm -hmm. garden continued even after those teachers left the school because we did have some teachers leave because they were military wise. Um, and, um, you know, one left to go teach internationally, but the garden was there and teachers said, we'll take it over. And so, you know, when you have a good idea and others buy into it, that's what makes us, you know, the good ideas continue. 
when you know it's not just one person right. doing it yeah so yeah and i think that that when we have when we build that trust with our communities um like they trust us uh mm -hmm. that if we encourage them to do something that's new to them and things go wrong that we got they got their backs right that's yes. that's really important uh, the other thing that you said I think is really important. I'm not against any school using a program, but I am against a school like not using their knowledge and, you know, nearness to a child to do what's best and actually stay stuck on the program. Right. And I think that, that's one of the things that um, we always actually, you know, kind of have to, to really kind of think about. Um, I'm going to ask you this. This is the last question I'm going to ask you. You, you have been, um, in education for 45 years. And, and I actually remember when I um, was a first year teacher, I'm like, what, like 30 years, that's going to be forever, right? And I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm a, it goes by quickly. Would you say that? Definitely. So as, as people are going through their career, the, you know, like an ups and downs, obviously, and uh, I, I feel, to be honest, you, I feel there's been a lot more downs and ups lately. Mm -hmm. um, what's some advice, you know, having a full career uh, in education that you could give to someone who's kind of, you know, going through that process right now? Well, one thing I think I would tell them is, you know, when I first started, we didn't have anything called internet or social media. Right. But, you know, um, there are so many people out there, educators, and you can learn from them. So I would encourage them to get onto social media, to Twitter, and to follow people like you or... Eric Schenninger or me, if they want to, but um, you know, we're not we're not telling them what to do, but we're giving them ideas, and I think that right. that's important. And once you get on, and you can, you'll have a, pro a professional learning network that you can count on, you know, to get new ideas right. from. And you know, some of um, my relationships with people have come through social media, you know. Yeah like you. And um, I think you can learn a lot from other people. And this world is a small world. You know what really, right. um, you know, you blog and I've been blogging and what really, um, it was hard for me to blog at first, you know, because I thought what would right. I have to say that somebody else would want to listen, what to say that this is important to them or, you know, it was, it was, I wasn't confident that I had anything positive to say but you know what i find is that people all over the they're having the same kinds of issues they're having the same they have you know oh i was thinking of that idea how did you you know so that conversation that you um that's created through social media i think is right. is really important and um uh i would i would suggest that and if you can't if you don't feel comfortable about that, at least have that collaborative uh, group of people that you can count on, people you can talk to, that you can go to the classroom at the end of the day and say, eh, I had a rough day, you know, and, and then you can talk it over. So you need, it's, it's a lonely profession if you make it a lonely profession. It right. can be a very, very um, rich um profession where you really are learning from each other. And I think that's what we really need to do. And, you know, I know that I've been really talking with teachers about sharing their stories. You know, you've got to share your stories. And many of them are very uh, hesitant to do so, saying, I don't have anything to share. And I'd say, but you do. You have. Tell your kids about why you became a teacher. Right. Tell them about a teacher who really you know, made an impression on you. Um, you know, why did you go into the profession and what makes it so um, rewarding to you? Um, it makes me really, really sad when I hear parents saying, um, my child wants to go to college to become a teacher, but I don't want them to. And mm. it, it really makes me sad because teaching to me is the most is such an honorable profession. Right. It is the most important profession because it's what makes all the other professions possible. Right. So I really want teachers to start sharing more, to to share their stories and, and for the general public to appreciate their teachers because yeah. 
especially in this last year, it's been just really, really difficult. I know, I mean, I'm not there, but I know how very difficult yeah. it's been for the teachers and for students and for school leaders. So, you know, share your appreciation for them. I think that's really, really important. Yeah. And that actually, you know, is one of the reasons because of a teacher actually came out is because we wanted to share stories about the mm -hmm. impact that teachers had. We wanted to kind of shine that light. And um, one of the things that you said, and I think this is true with our relationship, is we, we connected, I think, sporadically before I came to Hawaii. And then after we've connected a lot more, right? And I think yes. like here's here's an analogy that I've used before. But like when we were kids and we would go to like a summer camp, you'd like meet somebody, you'd become like best friends with them. You'd say, like, mm -hmm. we're never gonna not talk again. I'm gonna call you, but you know, long distance cost money then. It was like kind of a pain to write letters all the time. And you would lose touch with a lot of those people. And now our kids who ever go to a summer camp, they could actually never, they could easily connect with that person for the rest of their lives. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about, you know, social media is that it allows us to um, actually not just connect with people that we don't know, but actually reconnect with people that we meet in different spaces and really, you know, excel. And that's one of the reasons we got to sit down mm -hmm. and talk today. We've been connected all these years, even though you you don't remember me when I came there, but I always have to remind you, I remember when we met. So I have to always remember, yeah, of course, there, you, you sent me a message. Like, Do you remember me? I'm like, of course I remember you. I like named exactly where we were. So, um, hey, Jan, and uh, anyone who wants to follow Jan, uh, Jan's mm -hmm. Twitter link is in the bio, but I encourage you to check out uh, Educating with Aloha and you can see um, Jan, even though you're retired in 45 years, you are on the cutting edge of education uh, still to this day, and you're doing it through empathy and building relationships, which is what I'm all about. So I really appreciate you being on the podcast and taking time out of your uh, busy schedule to join me. And I hope uh, all the people listening get to connect with you. Thank you so much, George, for this opportunity. My pleasure. And, and, it, and I hope we get to do it again soon. Yeah. And maybe one day we'll meet in, in um, face to face again. Right. Hopefully. Hope not in Canada, though, in Hawaii. How do yeah. we <laughs> you are right now. It's hey, thanks everyone for okay. listening. Have a wonderful day.